Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, moving on into the Roman period, I think the last paper very nicely set this up by emphasising continuities rather than breaks over time. Uh, and sometimes it's much more profitable to see the archaeology and history of the Mediterranean as a continuum uh, and not fall into this old trap set up by people like Winkelmann and others in the 18th century, uh, which very much played off, you know, Greek is good, Roman is, is just copying. Um, uh, and a sort of value judgmental hierarchy of cultures, which is um, still, still present in, in art historical circles, as perhaps the British Museum Naked Greeks uh, exhibition showed us fairly recently. Um, we have three papers in the, in the Roman session, um, and um, we've got a couple of non-speakers on the uh, stage as well. This reminds me very much of a PhD defence in the Netherlands uh, some years ago, Carol van Driel Murray's um, PhD, where uh, a squad of legionary troops glowered at the audience of this open PhD defence. Um, <laughs> a little bit um, uh, 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 intimidating for the audience. So, first of all, we have uh, Dr. Mike Bishop um, talking about the impenetrable wall. Uh, Mike Bishop is known to you from a, a great raft of publications. Um, he is the ground zero for the Rome Military Equipment Seminar Series, later Rome Military Equipment Conference Series. Uh, so 1983 was the first one of those at Sheffield. He's also uh, co-authored the, the definitive uh, publication of the Corbridge Horde uh, and a two-volume study of the Lorica Segmentata. Uh, and he is currently working part-time at Oxford on the endangered archaeology of the Middle East and North Africa project, uh, which is working um, partly through his old PhD supervisor, uh, analysing archaeological sites and their changes in this uh, remarkably uh, difficult region at the moment through satellite photography. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Can you all hear me well enough? Good. I've been joined on the stage um, by the Smiths. Um, I hope this doesn't mean I am Morrissey. <laughs> They're going to be demonstrating some of the aspects of the armour I'm going to be talking about. This relief reused on the Arch of Constantine very nicely sums up our knowledge of Roman armour, body armour in particular is what I'm going to be talking about, but I might verge off into limb armour, with stylized uh, mail on the left-hand side, segmental armour in the centre and scale on the right-hand side. Uh, it's long been thought to be an anachronistic view of uh, armour during the 4th century AD, uh, but I want to come back to that uh, in a while. The first type that I want to look at, so I think it's valuable for us to know where we lie and look at the, uh, the evidence, is mail, which is being worn by my friend over here on your right. Um, Have you come over here? <laughs> move around. <laughs> <laughs> on the screen you can see a complete mail shirt that was found at Sugmantel in Germany. There are not many examples of complete mail shirts. Mail has an ability to uh, retain its integrity far greater than most of the uh, other forms of armour that I'm going to be talking about. You can see on the uh, left-hand side here another intact shield, uh, set of mail from South Shields, uh, detail of it at the bottom, and on the right-hand side, fragments of mail that have been recovered, and it's normally just small fragments that we, we find. Part of the reason for this is the inherent integrity, as I've said. Moving on to scale, uh, scale is even rarer as uh, a complete find. The example at the top comes from Carpu uh, in Fife in Scotland and is still attached to its textile backing. The important thing to remember with ordinary scale is that whilst uh, the scales are attached horizontally by wire ties to their neighbours, they're not attached vertically to their neighbours, so they have to be sewn onto a garment which means, of course, that once the garment rots or falls to pieces, um, the scales tend to just 
degrade into rows, and it's often rows of scales that we find. And then on the right-hand side, we have a fragment of an altogether different beast, which is what I call um, semi-rigid scale, which is a scale that is not only joined horizontally to its neighbours, but also vertically as well. Here's an example from Corbridge, looking at the rear, so you can see how the ties are uh, crossed over. Normally with semi-rigid scale, um, there is a degree of movement in it. It's not tied to be uh, completely rigid, which is why uh, the term semi-rigid is suitable for it. And this is actually quite useful because it enables the cuirass not only to have some movement in it, but also to dissipate uh, kinetic energy from any blow struck against it. Here's another example of, uh, sorry, this is an example of uh, one of the more unusual finds of uh, armour. This one comes from a site on the uh, A1 upgrade uh, near Helam Bridge, and it's an example of a type of armour that's been called Lorica plumata, but is in fact uh, a very fine uh, ring mail made of uh, copper alloy with small copper alloy scales attached to it. Uh, vastly more work goes into producing one of these than producing a standard iron mail shirt and even those take uh, a good deal of time. And of course the armour that's come to be uh, characteristic of the Roman army, perhaps unfairly on the, the other two, and that is uh, segmental plate armour. This is one of the sets of cuirasses from the Corbridge Horde which form the model for this example you can see here on the right-hand side, which John is wearing. Uh, and analysis of the Corbridge Horde was the first time that it was possible to deduce that the armour worked on a system of uh, iron, iron or steel plates over a leather framework. Could you perhaps lift up the arm? The point being that whilst we do have an increasing amount of leather finds from the Roman period, we do not find the leather straps from Larica segmentata except as mineralized products. Um, the Corbridge hoard was uh, nothing if not full of mineralized organic material, partly as a result of there being so much ferrous material in the first place. Uh, the iron oxide leached out into all the organics, whether they be leather, textile, wood, uh, and served to preserve them in a, a process resembling fossilization. Uh, and so this was how uh, Russell Robinson, uh, who was uh, instrumental in understanding how this uh, armor worked, was able to work out that it, was, it, it required a framework of uh, leather straps to, to hold it together. And part of that interpretation comes from his knowledge of Japanese armor. Some of the finds of Lorica segmentata um, show that there's more material than just uh, the Corbridge Hoard, although the Corbridge Hoard comes to dominate everybody's uh, appreciation of it. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, a collar plate from Chichester. Hi. Just under there. And on the top right, uh, what's supposed to be moving, but it isn't, is uh, a short film I took of a piece of Lorica segmentata from Plantation Place in London. And this was a rather significant find because it came from the immediate post Boudican fort uh, in uh, the centre of the city. And you can see my diagram at the bottom showing the uh, formation process. Essentially, the upper shoulder guard has been ripped off, and then the remainder of the uh, upper part of one side has been thrown down onto the ground and has twisted in the process. It has to be said that archaeologically Lorica segmentata is the most common find of armour and it is probably overrepresented by comparison with the other types of armour. I talked about the integrity of mail, it means finds of mail are comparatively rare. Likewise scale, um, it uh, you find more of it individually, but not as much as Larica segmentata. But it's difficult to judge from the finds we have whether that truly reflects the situation in terms of the 
distribution of the equipment amongst the troops. And let's move on to the, uh, the muscle cuirass, almost exclusively an officer, uh, and in this case, emperor, uh, defence. On the left-hand side, you can see the uh, bulbous and slightly uh, over-enthusiastic cuirass of the Augustus from Prima Porta, which has had a, a final spray of propaganda over it to give a little bit of extra interest. Whilst on the right side, um, Lucius Verus is wearing... Uh, a cuirass that looks not unlike the linen cuirass we were looking at earlier on, complete with gorgonaeon in the centre and uh, pseudo-tied uh, shoulder pieces. Um, and he certainly thinks he looks very fine in it. <laughs> but apart from body armour, we also have to consider uh, limb armour. This is one of those things that, uh, certainly working with material from Britain, we never really uh, paid too much attention to. Uh, until we started finding it in considerable amounts. Uh, on the left-hand side here, you can see an X-ray of one of the uh, sets of arm defences that were found at Carlisle during the Millennium excavations just outside Carlisle Castle. Uh, these two were articulated when they were lost, but they did not preserve any remains of the straps that quite clearly articulated them. On the right-hand side is uh, two fragments of uh, a ferrous grieve that came from the, the same site. Let's move on to the production of armour. It's important to stress that um, there is no simple way of defining how armour was, cons was constructed by the Roman army, except to remember the flexibility that was involved. Somebody once asked me, how many, um, how long does it take to make a, a male cuirass? And I said, it's a pointless question. Um, it's like, how long does it take to build a Roman road? It depends how many people you apply to doing the task. Likewise, with construction of mail, because it is a process requiring a large number of components that could be produced by uh, unskilled or semi-skilled labor and put together by only a few skilled people, it was quite possible that you could uh, line up an entire legion on an exercise ground, issue them with the components and get them to pass it forward to one chap at the front who would make you a male defence in possibly one or two hours. Um, so it's the amount of manpower and how you direct it to the task that dictates how long in hours it takes to do, but of course there is a constant in the man hours involved in it. I'm going to shamelessly steal some of the work that's been done by uh, Jamie Kaminsky and David Sim in terms of the analysis of Roman armour because they've done some extremely important work in showing us just how sophisticated Roman armour was. When I was a mere slip of a lad, it was generally thought that any Roman steel was accidentally produced uh, and that the Romans had very little control over the process. Their work has largely shown us that this is uh, a complete uh, misnomer and that, in fact, uh, the Romans had very fine control over the plate that they produced. Whether they were producing steel wire to make mail or scale or plate armour, they were able to control the quality of the material, so much so that David once commented to me, and you may care to withdraw this now, that some of the bog standard plate used in Larica Segmentata was finer, of better quality, than some of the best armour that you can find from the Renaissance period. Uh, and this was the stuff that they were issuing out to the ordinary legionaries. So how did they actually do the production? Well, we have some clues to uh, how it was done. Largely in the imperial period, it seems that legions in particular were responsible for their own equipment production. Uh, they had a range of specialities within the legion, and of course, most importantly from what I've just said, they also had the manpower, whether unskilled or semi-skilled, who could be applied to the task of producing the arms and armour that were needed. That doesn't mean to say there weren't specialist armourers working outside who could be producing material for those who could afford it, because you have to bear in mind that armour cost money, and soldiers would have the cost of their equipment deducted from their pay, um, but it does mean that the uh, large run-of-the-mill equipment that was necessary could be produced by the army itself. 
and we know something about the specialists who were involved in this. Uh, this small chunk from uh, the digest, which preserves a portion of Tarotiena's Paternus's military work, uh, a man who himself was not unknown to the military, li military life, uh, gives us some idea of the sort of range of specialists any legion would contain. It seems to be the, the case that this was the way the army was producing their equipment, and particularly their armour, during the 1st, 2nd and into the 3rd centuries AD, but change was to come. We have some documentary evidence from both Vindelander writing tablets and also from this Berlin papyrus, which records uh, legionaries and auxiliaries and civilians and slaves all working in a legionary fabrica making material of various different kinds. It doesn't actually specifically say they're making uh, armour outright, but uh, if they're making all the other things, you can bet your bottom dollar they're making armour as well. What we do have lots of evidence for, physically, is the fact that armour can be fragile. We have lots of evidence for repair and for maintenance. This is one of the pieces of the Corbridge hoard, and it shows how uh, one of the hinges up here, instead of being replaced with a working hinge, which we find examples of, different types of hinges put onto the wrong sorts of plates, has, and they've actually given up and they've riveted the two plates together. Um, one of the things that people query about Lorica Sementata is why does it have all these funny moving bits which don't seem to do anything? But again, I suspect it's all to do with the dissipation of uh, force when a weapon <coughs> strikes the armour. The movement that's available in the armour, whether it be on the leather straps or on the hinges, will all help to um, dissipate force and protect the wearer. This is one of the uh, drawing of one of the arm guards at, uh, from Carlisle. Uh, during the analysis of these, it was quite clear that uh, both copper alloy and ferrous rivets had been used to attach the straps running up and down the defence, and that by looking at the patterning, we could see that the, uh, each of these so-called intact ones was in fact made up of components of different ones. So you'd see a run of copper alloy uh, rivets and then another chunk with ferrous rivets and then another chunk with copper alloy rivets. In fact, these are what you could call cut and shuts. It's cannibalism in operation and it's something the military always does well. The Royal Air Force invented the word cannibalism and this is one reason why. Here's a man taking a Spitfire apart. In fact, the Royal Air Force um, trained a special unit to uh, construct Spitfires in the field when they were damaged uh, with rudimentary jigs. The aircraft was manufactured in jigs, unlike the Hurricane, which made it very difficult to repair. It had to be sent away. So prior to D-Day, uh, the Royal Air Force actually trained up a unit of mechanics who could repair Spitfires in the field from quite serious major damage. War makes... Uh, incredibly ingenious uh, mechanics of us all. Protection. I see three components to the protection provided by any armour. First of all, we have what I call the carapace, the armour itself. So the stuff on the outside. By itself, it's pretty useless. You just drop it down on the floor, it falls into a pile. It doesn't do anything. Second, we have a need for energy dissipation. I've talked about this already, about how the armour in some way does this, but also we have the undergarments underneath the armour that are there to help absorb the shock and to distribute it. And again, the work by Simon Kaminsky suggests this doesn't need to be great big thick padding. Even small, uh, fairly thin garments will do the job. And we saw earlier on with the case of the, lin the linothorax that... Uh, bunching a tunic underneath can have the desired effect of uh, dissipating this energy. And finally, the frame, the human body. If you just stick a set of lorica segmentata on a, on a pole and hit it, it, uh, it collapses. It's not very strong by itself. You have to have all three components, the carapace, the uh, padding, and the frame to make body armour work. They're all uh, intimately linked. 
One of the things that has intrigued me is the study of this second layer, the padding that lies underneath the armour. Um, one of the clues to its existence comes from the work uh, the Historia Augusta, where Septimius Severus is made, uh, makes the Praetorian Guard parade wearing just the subamalis uh, and without weapons. It's uh, one of those pe passages that begs the question of what is the subamalis? It's obviously something they wear, but it's not something that's particularly threatening. Equating that with the Thoracomachus, which is described by the anonymous in the De Rebus Bellicus, and here illustrated in a, a Renaissance illustration, um, gives us some clues to what this garment was like. It was included felt, it may have had a leather covering, uh, and it was in fact proposed at one point as a defence in its own right. Um, although Dr. Colston over there has argued uh, cogently that this was never actually practiced by the Roman army and that you can trace the use of body armour right through into the late Roman period. Nevertheless, uh, our ingenious hero of the uh, De Rebus Bellicus thought that it might be a solution to his problem. This tombstone of Severius Acceptus has often been suggested as depicting uh, one of these uh, padded garments, uh, but that then worries me slightly as to where is his armour. It looks to me more like a misunderstanding of armour than a depiction of uh, an undergarment. On the other hand, the garments draped on the uh, right-hand side of both of these Marses, one of whom looks uncannily like Hadrian, um, are good candidates for um, identification as an undergarment, possibly the Subomalis or Theracomachus. Uh, there's been a lively debate on this issue on the Roman Army Talk website over the last few months, and it's worth looking into if you're interested in it, but it's very difficult to come up with a definitive answer. It just looks slightly more convincing uh, than some of the other uh, interpretations. I'm so tempted to write a caption to what Sabina is saying to Hadrian at that point. <laughs> And then we have this wonderful passage written by a Decurian from uh, Carlisle, dating to around the same time, slightly before the, uh, arm, the arms that we saw, uh, where he's reporting to his prefect the missing equipment that his troops have. And this includes amongst these uh, a reference to subamales. So these troops are going into battle without the required padding underneath their, their armour, if this is the correct interpretation. Roger Tomlin has suggested that a subamalis is in fact uh, a type of javelin, uh, but myself, I'm still uh, inclined to interpret it as uh, padding for armour. And finally, this illustration from uh, my original article some years ago, looking at the whole process of why we needed um, padding underneath armour, goes into the business of the, the human frame. If you look at the average human being, um, their uh, collarbones slope down. The trapezium muscles mean that it's very difficult for lorica segmentata to sit correctly, and you end up with this situation where the uh, breastplates cross over. Unlike these. Excuse me, could you send them back? <laughs> <laughs> could you do it back, chaps? We have our soldiers back. Go on, John. I could get them to march up and down, but I think that's a little bit too intimidating. <laughs> Shades of the Praetorian Guard and the, uh, the Emperors. The point is that to make Lorica Segmentata work well, you have to pad it underneath the shoulders to get it to sit correctly. Uh, so it thereby requires there to be some sort of garment, some sort of padding underneath the shoulders. Uh, and this accords well with what we found uh, other evidence for, for an undergarment, the subamalis. Here we have troops doing what troops do, according to Trajan's column, uh, demonstrating their flexibility. Could you demonstrate your flexibility, please? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the power. Uh, I'll get them to do the sand dance at the very end. If you want to do very but it's an important requirement that troops should be able to move, given that we're dealing with an engineering army uh, 
who have to dig a camp at the end of every day's uh, march. They're not all going to take their armour off, dig it, and then put the armour back on. Trajan's column then gives us a classical view of what the Roman army looked like at the beginning of the 2nd century AD, but at Adam Clissy in Romania, we get a very different view. Here we can see soldiers wearing scale and mail, but we don't see segmental body armour. We do see arm guards and greaves being used by the soldiers. And this reconstruction by Jim Bowers shows uh, an attempt to depict what a Roman legionary may have looked like in the Hadrianic period in the north of Britain. We see arm guards being used, more and more evidence is coming out for these, greaves being used, um, and also you can see the arrival of pterogays. We've seen those before, and they're back. Usually pterogays were found with uh, imperial statues, with officers, but now they're starting to figure amongst the equipment of the ordinary soldiers as well. But this figure gives us two interesting insights into what the different sources tell us. We can see on the left-hand side the arm guard, the pterogays, and the greaves coming from Adam Clissy. On the right-hand side, a helmet with cross pieces to protect against um, the falcs, uh, and also Lorica segmentata. Um, so the evidence is diverse and rich, but we have to be very careful how we interpret it and what it tells us about the development of Roman armour. Here is uh, a phalera uh, in the Cabinet des Médailles in uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, and it shows uh, a group of legionaries along the top, all of whom appear to be having or wearing pterogays under their armour. And this piece, although it's often said to come from uh, France, it's probably from uh, Italy. So, to the protection that the armour actually offers, I've talked about this business of uh, absorbing shock. There was more you could do as well by overlapping plates. Uh, Lorica segmentata, particularly on the shoulder area, was very uh, diligent in the overlap of plates. So when you struck it vertically, you were almost certainly going to be hitting two plates worth of thickness at the very least. And on the right hand side you can see how with scale the overlap uh, again ensures that a large portion of the scale is protected by its neighbours. And again that's from uh, David Sim and Jamie Kaminsky's book. As is this, showing you once more how striking at an angle across uh, scales adds to the protection of uh, from the armour. Vulnerability. Now, I'm going to take one particular example here, uh, which cheekily isn't actually to do with the, the Roman army, except that the Roman army proved to be the undoing of these chaps. So it all goes back to the revolt of Florus and Sacrovia in AD 21, um, when amongst the various lowlifes and what have you who uh, revolted, there were slaves equipped as crupillarii. These were gladiators almost entirely encased in steel armour uh, who um, proved to be something of an obstacle to the Romans. There's a small figurine on the left-hand side that Picard identified as one of these crupillarii and here is a modern reenactor who has, a rather unwisely I suspect if it's hot, uh, attempted to equip himself in much the, the same way. The point was that when the Roman legionaries came up against these guys who were as heavily defended as you could possibly be and still just about move, um, they found that they couldn't cut them down with the traditional pilum and gladius and so forth, um, so they merely set about them with their delabri, their pickaxes and their axes and hacked away at them and pulled them over with poles and did all sorts of things. Um, the point being that uh, there is a compromise between defence and mobility. And what you see with the Roman soldiers, I would argue, is that very fine distinction between being too mobile and too well protected. I like this quote. Um, 
not least because I like the fact that it says body armour good practice, not best practice. <laughs> so presumably policemen don't necessarily deserve best practice in terms of uh, their preservation in their line of duties. It's a very interesting report, should you care to read it. So finally we come to the evolution of uh, Roman armour. What was the fantastic uh, developments that went on from the early imperial period through to the late Roman uh, period with body armour? And I'm afraid the answer isn't very exciting. Um, one of the major developments that came in Roman military equipment production was the institution of uh, state fabricae, state workshops. And here's a map showing you the distribution of some of these. And you'll note that some of these are for armour production. However, the picture from the archaeology suggests that this is not the whole story. And then, in fact, in provincial areas, something very different is going on, or rather, the same thing as before is going on. Uh, many years ago, during excavations, I think it was in the lanes at Carlisle, uh, this fragment of a Newstead-type Lorica segmentata was found um, in a 4th century context. And at the time it was dismissed as being residual uh, and that it was obviously uh, dating to a much earlier period. I should point out that amongst the Carlisle Millennium finds there was an almost identical piece of Newstead armour with a Hadrianic date. Um, and so this sort of got shuffled to one side until comparatively recently excavations in Leon in Spain found in more than one location uh, very clear evidence of both the Corbridge and the Newstead types of Lorica segmentata continuing on into respectively the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. So it then begins to look as if the uh, armour from Carlisle in Britain may fit into the same pattern and that it is not residual and that it actually belongs in the late Roman period. In which case we have types of body armour being introduced in the first century AD with the invasion of Britain, which then maintain uh, or are carried on in use with very little development right the way through into the third and fourth centuries AD, which to me says that they did their job and that they were what soldiers wanted to use and that despite the fact that Lorica segmentata has an alarming tendency to fall apart and disintegrate, uh, it nevertheless was thought worth the while of the, the PBI who had to reassemble these things in their barracks, presumably, or if necessary, take it off to the workshop to have the whole thing uh, stuck back together or stuck in a chest, of course. There's always that option. Um, so that the armour of the legionaries and the auxiliaries from that period, the first century, uh, second century AD, um, was adequate. They felt no need to enhance it or change it. We don't see any of the eastern styles of armour, lamellar armour in particular, coming to the west. There's no <coughs> evidence of that whatsoever. You sometimes see semi-rigid scale being misidentified as lamellar armour, but that's not the case. We only ever have scale, semi-rigid scale, male and segmentata in Britain and in the other provinces where we have detailed records of excavation and examination. This has been um, rather uh, interestingly diagrammed by uh, Joaquim Arakakia, a man who once told me that his nickname for me was Bishu, which means bug. I'll get him back one day. Um, who modified my battleship diagram showing the uh, use of Lorica segmentata to extend it to uh, much later. So into the 3rd century with uh, Corbridge type and into the 4th century with uh, the Newstead type. This is somewhat akin to us still using Spitfires in the Royal Air Force. Such is the lack of development that's gone on uh, in these terms. So I've given you a brief insight, I hope, into the way that uh, Roman armour uh, can be seen to have developed, i.e. not at all, giving you some indication of how it was manufactured in a very inventive uh, and cooperative way, uh, and also shown how it functioned to some extent uh, in terms of its practicalities. And that the key thing to remember is the balance between protection and mobility. 
There are works you can refer to if you wish to take this further. The two on the, or the one in the centre and the one on the left are available free online. I'd particularly like to thank Dr. Mike Thomas for making his volume available. The other one is available from all good bookshops and even from some not so good bookshops, allegedly. And finally, that is the end of the impenetrable work. Indeed, it's also a way to look at uh, a supply of capable, semi-skilled men going out into society, assuming they survive life in the army. Right, uh, let's go for the gentleman on the back row there first. Just, just a quick question, are they, are they put toilet on? Hello. Um, my question is the change from male to segmented after. Is this down to the type of fighting that the Legion did against the auxiliary? Because the auxiliary in the main kept the male armour. Um, some people would argue that all units were equipped with Lorica segmentata. I don't agree with that. I think segmentata is better suited to infantry who fight as heavy infantry in close formation and that male is a more versatile form of armour. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to both, which you can see diagrammed in David Sim and Jamie Kaminsky's book, um, but um, I think that the, the, the segmentata uh, provides better protection if you are fighting in close formation as uh, regular heavy infantry, as the legionaries would do, whereas the auxiliaries who are required to fight as open order skirmishing infantry and on occasion as close order heavy infantry, uh, are best equipped in mail. And the fact that we still find legionaries using mail and scale suggests that they weren't too unhappy about the uh, not having to use Larica segmentata. So I think there were probably marginal <coughs> benefits for legionaries to, to use Larica segmentata, but there were plenty of them who were happy to use mail and scale. Um, you've talked about mostly evidence, obviously, from uh, sort of the northern side of the Mediterranean in terms, obviously, of Britain, Germany, and so forth. Um, in the hotter climates, given being the Roman army who they were, do you think they adapted to the climate they serviced in? I mean, they seem to, for instance, with things like you know, boots and sort of clothing and so forth. Would they have adapted their armour with the possibility, for instance, of sort of, you know, hotter climates of North Africa where you're going to be inside your own personal wrap of bako foil over there? Uh, of the wearing perhaps, say, adapting to linen armour or something, you know, like we were seeing this morning, would there be sort of, you know, some possibility of that, do you think? Well, given that we have a limited pool of evidence from those areas, it's difficult to tell, but as I'm sure Guy is going to go on and talk about later on, there is evidence from the East that suggests that they were pretty much equipped the same there as they were in the West. If anything, um, there's a tendency to um, winterize legionaries um, with the uh, adaptation of knee-length trousers and so forth and lots of capes and, and cloaks. Um, so I think more in the colder regions are they adapting than they are 
in the hot regions, but we have very little evidence from anywhere apart from um, Israel to, to help us with this. I mean, we need a lot more evidence from some of the unstable areas, unfortunately. Gentlemen, gentlemen, we're beside the you make it sound as if the body armour of the Roman soldier doesn't develop that much over the period the armies in Britain, but surely we see some development in their weapons from the simple sharpened iron bars to laminated pattern welded blades and different types of weapons. So the Roman army does show some improvement, would you say? Uh, definitely, definitely improvement in weapons, but in terms of armour, there doesn't seem to be any improvement. But yeah, I'd agree with, completely with you. With, with, there is a continuing evolution in the, in the weaponry they deploy. Would you say that the hook and eye attachments of the new city design of the segment carter are an improvement over the leather straps and buckles of the core bridge. In that, <laughs> in that they don't break or stretch and require less repair. Um, I think that there's a good proportion of the Roman army who thought they were an improvement. Um, having talked to people who put on reconstruction Newstead ones, I gather they are more difficult to put on than the core bridge one, but it's not prohibitively difficult to do it. So I think, yes, it is an improvement because it is a simplification. All those leather straps flapping around uh, are particularly troublesome, especially if you go through extremes of climate. Uh, and it's been pointed out to me by reenactors that they usually carry around with them several spare uh, leather laces so that they can repair themselves in the field if need be but because of the tendency to drop apart with Larica segmentata. I guess scale as well would do it, but male, as I've said, is, is a much a much more uh, solid defence in those terms. What you perhaps interject that, that we've got a lot of cultural history here in that, because Robinson's model was from complex to simple, uh, driven by efficiency, uh, and uh, that was very much based on what happens in the uh, 15th to 17th centuries in Japanese armour much more riveting, much less lacing, partly to do with removing as much lacing as possible in order to um, cut down the rot, um, the effects of long-term dampness, uh, of corrosion, uh, of lice, etc., getting into those organic parts um, during a long period of war between the daimyos of Japan. Someone yeah. checked the description of Carlisle. Russell Robinson's background of the Eastern Army, Eastern Army yeah. Um, question about the uh, arm guards and the reinforced helmets. So I thought they were a weapon specific modification for the facts. Are, are you saying that they carried on being used just generally? And are there any other weapon specific modifications to the armor that you can think of? Um, well, until the Carlisle Millennium find, um, there were only a few fragments of arm guard from, this, from the UK. Examples from Corbridge, from Vindolanda, quite a few pieces from Richborough as well. But it, was, it wasn't until components of three or four complete arm guards came from Carlisle that we began to see uh, in the Hadrianic period, a period when there's hints of disturbance anyway, uh, that um, there was some response going on that was more than just uh, Dacian war improvements meeting problems that were specific to that particular war and that they, they, they clearly saw that these things had an application elsewhere. Can I think of any other uh, improvements? Not off the top of my head, but as soon as I sit down I'll be able to come up with about ten. <laughs> <laughs> and there are hints of, of pre trigenic uses of Manakai. Yeah, there's a, there's a late Flavian tombstone. So the, so the anti-missile missile explanation that goes with the Dacian Falx is, is more complex um, because you've got them all across the northern frontiers of the empire uh, facing cultures that don't use any form of really heavy blade weapon like that. Hi, Mike. Um, I was just thinking um, when they were coming into contact in the eastern provinces with the uh, Persians, the uh, Parthians and then the Sasanians in the third century. 
how effective was the armour against Arthur? You know, thinking in terms of the recurve bow, the Scythian style recurve bow. Um, well, that, that's only the same sort of bow that they're, they're facing much earlier. Uh, I mean, it was disastrous against uh, for Crassus at Carhai, but that was for tactical reasons rather than for uh, equipment reasons. Um, it has to do with how you protect your infantry with a mobile cavalry component to keep anybody who's going to sit there and take pot shots at you at a distance. Um, so I think that's more a tactical consideration than anything in terms of uh, protection. But that being said, most Roman armour, from, from what David Simmons told me, is, is able to resist most archery. Um, there's always going to be, you know, if you go and do a point-blank test, uh, you could probably shoot through something, but that's not the reality of warfare. The reality is standing off and shooting lots of arrows at a distance where the things don't have quite as much energy when they land as they do if you're shooting directly at a target or something. And I know David's done a lot of uh, research into this and it's documented uh, in his and, and Jamie's book. So um, I, I wouldn't worry too much about the protection quality uh, of Roman armour. I think they would very rapidly have done something about it if it caused problems. The fact that Lorica Segmentata lasts into the 4th century says to me as I've said, that it, it, they found it adequate. Um, earlier we heard about the, um, the part of the Samurai armour that um, had a bit of symbolic significance. Are there any parts of um, Roman armour that have any like, religious or symbolic significance? Um, that's difficult to tell. Um, no, nothing that survives in the, in the documentary evidence. Of course, lots of the uh, cavalry helmets have uh, large elements of uh, symbolism, uh, mythological and otherwise, built into them. Uh, it's difficult to think of anything on something like a Lorica Segmentata that, that, uh, that gives you a clue. I mean, there isn't a massive phallus embossed on the thing for good luck or something. Um, I'm sure that could be done, but it hasn't been done as far as we know. Uh, that being said, the cavalry were all charging around with all range of uh, interesting things hanging off their, off their horses. Um, but so far as I know, no, there isn't any component like that, apart from the, the muscle crasses I showed you on the two emperors, who have, one of whom had the Gorgoneon in the centre, which is a, an apotrop apotropaic feature. That's about it. There's one down the middle ground Yeah, Roman cavalry would have uh, flat shields specific to their purpose. Tombstones show that they're oval in shape, sometimes hexagonal in shape. Occasionally also um, flat rectangular as well, but hexagonal and, and uh, curved. Again, it goes back to this thing about how male is slightly more versatile in combat. A flat shield is slightly more versatile for somebody who wants to fight in both close order and in open order, whereas a legionary shield is very specific to the way in which they would fight uh, each man protecting himself with, with that shield. Can I show you some moves? Can I show you some moves? <laughs> now there's a loaded question. <laughs> how about lifting up the shield? Pick up the shield and show us how high you can lift it. And then hold that for now. <laughs> so the armour doesn't in any way hinder their degree of movement. It would be completely ridiculous if it did. So they have to be able to, uh, to move in combat and also undertake all of the, the engineering tasks that are required of them. Um, so it has to be flexible, whatever they're using. Uh, and as I've already hinted, the flexibility in the armour is also... Uh, an important component, I suspect, of its defensive qualities. Any more? Hmm? <laughs> Where were you in 1984? <laughs> it's very easy to do 
the draw, it was, there was a whole paper written by Peter Hazel about the fact that they couldn't possibly draw the sword in that way, but in fact it's a very natural uh, movement. And there is in fact a, a rather interesting uh, relief amongst the, the Adam Clissy combat scenes where it shows a legionary jabbing a sword down like a giant dagger into the neck, the, the shoulder, the collarbone of a poor unfortunate Dacian. Which, which interestingly, as, a, as an iconographic composition, is very similar to how gladiators are executed in the arena. They're mm. sawed down through into the, into the lungs or heart from above. Could you just demonstrate, if, if you draw your sword... <laughs> no, not execution. Uh, hold, it, hold it as if you're going to strike. Lift the shield up, protect yourself. And advance the sword. Now, this is key to why they had to adapt the equipment. Look at the vulnerable parts on him now. You've got the arm, which is vulnerable, and also the leading leg as well, where the greave would have to go. This is why the Carlisle armour, or Carlisle Millennium site, produced, I suspect, these articulated arm guards and greaves to give that extra cover so that the soldier is effectively covered from his eyes all the way down the shield, all the way down to his feet. Okay, one more over here. Um, I understand the controversial issue. If we're talking about symbolism and non practicality, have you any insight on the pendulum and why it's so useless? It makes a lovely <laughs> noise. Reenactors often call it the danglium. <laughs> I do not approve of such terms, but it does make a very nice noise, and it's all part of the, the presence of the soldier as he's moving around. You'll notice the soldiers on first century <laughs> tombstones uh, are shown wearing tunics, no armour, but they do have the military belt and the, the apron. Uh, so you knew when a soldier was coming, not only by appearance, but also by, by sound. <laughs> Jingling and hobnails and all those, those elements. I've heard that they used it for the marching technique. Marching step? Ah, marching in step. Now there's a thorny subject. Uh, <laughs> No, there's no evidence for that. I, it depends upon the fact that it would depend upon Roman armies marching in cadence step, and there's a lot. There are many arguments as to why the Roman army wouldn't march in cadence step, but would march at the same speed. Vegetius is very specific, or very non-specific in saying you all had to learn the military step. He doesn't say everybody marched uh, sin, 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 dex, sin. <laughs> yes, just a curious point, and I'm not dealing really with shields, but uh, your shields here are displayed a black background. Uh, a lot of the Ermine Street Guard reenactors have red shields. Is there any reason that the shape of different colour, different regions? It's, it's purely inter-unit rivalry. Uh, the red on the Ermine Street Guard hides the blood very effectively, I think. <laughs> the, 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 the evidence for shield colouring is, is very limited. We unfortunately don't have any tombstones that uh, preserve much in the way of shield colour, so far as I'm aware. All we have are the shields from Duria Ropos, where you've got one legionary shield and half a dozen auxiliary shields, which, uh, where red predominates as the colour on the front, uh, but we have a whole range of colours on the back, including blue, or midnight blue, I think it is, on, on one of them. Um, but in terms of, of shield blazons, the sort of thing that people like to analyse on Trajan's column, I think you really need an expert on Trajan's column to hand, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's very thorny ground and minimal evidence. So reenactors go with, with what they've got, basically. Right, we'll make that the last question. One more here. Okay, so just one quick one. Um, was there anything to show rank on the armour, or was that something dangling? <laughs> uh, well, you, you, you wouldn't be able to tell a Miles Gregarius, an ordinary soldier who had to do um, you know, everyday duties, from an immunist, the guys who were listed on the thing. I mean, they, by what they did, they would show who they were. But there's nothing about them to distinguish uh, between them in terms of uh, rank. It's only when you get an optio who has... Uh, a staff with a knob on the end of it and the centurion who has a completely different panoply with a transverse crest and the sword and dagger reversed and so forth. But amongst the ordinary soldiery there's no sort of subtle distinctions marked out, no arm badges or anything like, like that. Could I just take this opportunity to uh, thank 
John and Tom Smith for their strong <laughs> patiently putting up with my non-specific and very strange requirements. <laughs> Which gives me flashbacks to the 1983 Roman military equipment seminar when, having been working on Trajan's column for being someone interested in this figure with the Lauren Segmentata, first time I, I had a, how can I put this delicately, a member of a reenactment group wearing that stuff to play with. Um, <laughs> and we were in a room with seating and tables around four sides with an urban street guard person in the middle. And I'm facing him, he's facing me, and I said, um, you know, how high can you raise your arms? And he rose, do, do it, go with the long same time. How high can you raise both of your arms? No problem at all. So I said, how far can you then bend over and touch your toes? And everybody who was behind him, <laughs> <laughs> the laughter. Uh, on that note, um, I'm taking a tea, uh, and if you could all be back in the room and in your seats sharply by half past, we'd be very grateful. And it remains just to thank the speaker. Thank you very much. Right.